G'day everyone. Uh, Minister, uh, special welcome to our international guests. And Greg, thanks for the, uh, the intro and um, you know that brings back great memories, particularly that thrashing of the French in the final. Um, <laughs> And I always love that reaction to the underarm, you know, and I know we've got some Aussie guests here, so I can say to you, um, you know, we've, we've just about forgotten about it. It was a long time ago. Um, I think probably something like, I don't know, 31 years, uh, five months, six days, seven hours. Anyway, we, we are over it. Um, you should know, uh, I stand here, and you'll be a bit surprised at this, I stand here as, uh, I regard myself anyway as a, as a bit of an expert in oil and gas. Um, I say that on the back of, um, I played a game of golf with, with Rob Jager one day, and um, for four hours he just pummeled me with information about his industry. It was incredibly distracting. Um, my golf fell apart, he won, so he was happy. But um, I have to say, at the end of it, though, I came away with, with a pretty good sense of, of um, the fact you're in a pretty cutthroat industry. Um, it's not easy. Uh, not challenging. Uh, it is pretty challenging. Um, but lots of potential there for New Zealand. Uh, and it's something I think that, and particularly as I've sort of absorbed a whole lot of conversations tonight and did a bit of homework for turning up today, um, you, I think you can be entitled to be pretty confident about your future. You're already a, a pretty significant part of the makeup of New Zealand. Um, and there's a lot more potential there that if things go the right way, um, that, that you, can, you can do a great job. But when I was trying to think about what, what can I say to you people that, that sounds like I know something that you might not, um, and there wasn't a lot, I have to say, that I could think of. And I looked through the conference, sort of uh, the various sessions you've been having, and, and um, I have to say that, that um, not a lot of stuff resonated with me. I didn't know a hell of a lot about uh, closed-loop circulation drilling. Um, but I thought one of, the, one of the things that might be helpful, and it's only a suggestion, and I'm, I'm uh, just saying it is a suggestion because I've stood up in tourism and I've only been there nine months, and... Every time I offer something that sounds like a really strong opinion, people take offence. So I've, I've got used to just saying, well, it's a suggestion, um, <laughs> even though it might be in order. Um, <laughs> you know you're a good industry, but you're a little bit sensitive about the fact that the rest of New Zealand doesn't know that and doesn't accept it. And I'll tell you what, that's exactly the same in tourism, so I'm not singling you out. It's exactly the same in cricket as well. I can't understand it. I mean, <laughs> that's a complete another story. I could go on about that for a while, but I won't. Um, so I thought, uh, just linking it into the Rugby World Cup, I could maybe string together something that, that tells you the importance of, of um, how you gather in that support and... Um, telling you your own story in a way that other people might listen to. Um, because I think that's, that's something that is really worth doing, something that's really worth concentrating on, is that, that you know yourselves how good you are and you know what the potential is. You need to win others over and you need to win champions that are going to tell your story for you. So, you know, that's, that's not a lot different than, than what we had uh, at the start of the Rugby World Cup project. I think Greg mentioned I started in 2007. So it was, it was four years of building up for that event. It wasn't just something that sort of happened from uh, the 9th of September 2011. It actually took four years to create the foundations for it. And not everything went particularly smoothly. A lot didn't. Um, but in the end, I guess it, it sort of came together. Can I just get a show of hands? Who went to, who went to a match? Oh, that's pretty good. Who watched a game on TV or went to a, a fan zone? And I know there's some international guests here, and I'm not counting you here, but, but did anyone not go to a match or watch a game on TV? 
would you mind just leaving for a while? I mean, just... <laughs> what were the highlights? What are the sort of things that stick in your mind? Volunteers. Volunteers? Last 10 minutes. It was a bit longer than that. <laughs> Where? Oh, Nelson. Yeah, no, that was great. Yeah, white bait fishing. Okay, so there's a whole diversity there. And I'm going to tell you, some of you are obviously under the weather for a while there, but I'll, t I'll tell you my highlights. Can you remember when the Tongan team turned up at the airport when they arrived in New Zealand? Auckland Airport, about five or six days before the start of the tournament. We'd had each of the teams arriving at the airport. New Zealand was getting itself really geared up then. They knew that, uh, you know, this thing we'd been talking about for four or five years had suddenly become real. And um, the Tongan, Tongan team turned up last, and we'd been working with the Tongan community in Auckland, which is pretty uh, sizeable, and getting them pretty geared up to support their team well. The Tongan team arrives in at 4.30 uh, at Auckland International Airport on a Monday afternoon, and 7,000 uh, Tongans based in Auckland go out to meet them. And um, a lot of them park their cars on the southern motorway. <laughs> Some of them not even facing in the right direction. Now, I'd had guys working on risk management and traffic management for years. And, you know, not one of them had picked this to happen. I mean, that shows you the... I had to do everything in this bloody tournament anyway. So that caused enormous chaos, and the tournament hadn't even started. And I looked at it, and I thought, geez, that's fantastic. You know, people are getting into the, to the spirit of things. That, that was one of the best things that could have happened. It, it just sort of went right across the nation and everyone suddenly was in the zone. They were going to have a good time. Um, and the Tongans, in fact, right through the tournament, I think, were favourites of the New Zealand people. Their support uh, right around New Zealand was fantastic and they topped it off with a great win against the French in, in Wellington. Um, the night of the opening ceremony was something really special. We had been building into this for a long time. The lady who, is putting, who has put together your conference, Suzanne Perry Chapman, was the person responsible for putting together the opening ceremony. And listen, uh, we all knew that if that went wrong, our, our future careers were history. Um, but we had 20 minutes. We knew we had an audience of 60,000 in the stadium, but we actually had a, a, a worldwide television audience of 60 million that night for the opening ceremony, and we knew we had to get that right. Somehow we needed to make New Zealand shine uh, in that 20 minutes or 25 minutes we had. And uh, furthermore, we'd taken the inexplicable uh, step of appointing an Australian to actually produce the show, and that caused a hell of a reaction around New Zealand. Um, but this guy knew what he was doing, and we delivered that opening ceremony and it was just something incredibly special. that The, the public had already known uh, with the arrival of the Tongans that they were going to have fun. Until the opening ceremony was delivered, they had not really appreciated just what a high-quality event New Zealand was actually going to deliver. And so when New Zealanders actually glued into the television set that night or were in the stadium at Eden Park, they stood up, they took notice, they stood tall, they knew New Zealand was going to shine. And that was a fantastic feeling. There was a lovely moment a week later at Eden Park, though, when um, the Aussies were playing uh, Ireland. I'm not picking on the Aussies tonight, I promise you, but it just so happens. Um, and we'd been encouraging New Zealanders, you know, as part of the flavour of the scene, to get dressed up in the colours of the teams that were playing. 60,000 people at Eden Park. And you know what, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them dressed up in the yellow of the wallabies, you know, and there were 55,000 in emerald green. <laughs> I don't know why, it just, that's the way it happened. Just telling the truth here. Um, and inside the ground, it, it, it felt like you're at Lansdowne Road in Dublin. I mean, the, the crowd just got so much in behind um, the Irish and lifted them to what actually was a magnificent upset victory in the end, turn the tournament on its head because all of us had thought uh, leading into the tournament that Australia would go down one side of the draw, the All Blacks would go down the other side and those two teams would, would play in the final. Suddenly the Aussies were on our side of the draw and that left all of the Northern Hemisphere teams who had come to New Zealand thinking they had no show whatsoever in this tournament, all of them on the other side of the draw 
knowing that one of them was going to get through to the final, and they all rated themselves against each other. So they all stood up and thought, hell, we've got a chance here. And that was the best thing that happened for the tournament. At the end of that game, the Sky TV guy rushes out, he grabs the Irish captain, Brian O'Driscoll, and, and Brian looks up at the crowd and he said, I am just so grateful to all those people that have flown out from Dublin to support us for this match. <laughs> And I'm laughing my head off thinking, mate, most of those guys have come from Mount Eden or Papatoe or <laughs> Henderson. And tomorrow they're going to shove red on and get them behind the Welsh. Uh, and that's, that's exactly what happened. Is anyone here from Palmerston North? You don't have to be that shy. <laughs> Although we do all feel sympathy for you. But anyway, that's another story. Palmerston North had been sitting around the whole of the pool waiting for their matches to come. It wasn't until right late and the first match that they hosted was uh, a match between Georgia and Romania, the two powerhouse teams of world rugby. Um, and so they were getting a bit itchy about this and wondering whether or not they were going to come up to the standard of, of, um, of the rest of the tournament. Um, one of the things, if you follow Manawatu, which is the home team in, in Palmerston North, um, and has Massey University there, uh, one of the things traditionally they've been doing over the last five or six years is the students, when they go along to watch Manawatu play, wear buckets on their heads. Um, ladies, do you know why? No? It's pretty exciting, though, eh, for Parvester North? Um, so two days out from, from this match, Romania and Georgia, the mayors get together of, of Palmerston North and the local, local districts, and uh, the mayor of Palmerston North, a great guy called John O'Neill, says, right, we'll... We'll take, on, um, we'll take on the Romanian team, and, and he says, you, you other guys, you take on Georgia. And, and between them, they went out and they bought 6,000 buckets, 3,000 red and 3,000 and yellow, and they handed them out to the crowd. And they wore them at, at the ground. So most of the, most of the people in the ground had buckets on their heads, <laughs> which, which was, again, really exciting in Palmerston North. But I was at the game, and I was looking out, and I was chuckling away. I couldn't help but think, what would it be like when you are waking up on the other side of the world at 5am, turn on Rugby World Cup, and, and uh, the cameras are panning the crowd and they're all sitting there with buckets on their heads? <laughs> well, the knowledgeable rugby people amongst them say, oh, this game must be in Palmerston North. So there. Um, <laughs> the, the story um, behind the tournament was called... Um, catchphrase, a stadium of four million. Um, someone's actually written a fantastic book about it, but anyway. Um, it started out as a, as a rugby story. It started out when New Zealand Rugby wanted to win the rights to the tournament. And um, they came up with this concept that New Zealand would, would turn itself into a country, a stadium of four million rugby nuts and would provide the most brilliant rugby experience. It was a brilliant idea and it worked and we won the rights. When we started to look at it and think about uh, whether this would work, we decided it wouldn't. And uh, the reason for that is that um, only about half the country, if you, if you believe the stats, and there's been uh, research done for years and years on the popularity of rugby, um, about half the country likes or loves rugby and the other half is pretty indifferent to it or, or there's a few that actively dislike it. And we figured that, that if New Zealand was going to really make the most of this opportunity, um, it wasn't going to be it on the back of rugby. Uh, rugby would be at the core of this, but actually it would be on the back of who we were as New Zealanders. So we actually started uh, broadening our story from it being a rugby story into a story about New Zealanders. We started to deliberately go about gathering in uh, those people who wouldn't otherwise be interested in, in a rugby event. Um, not surprisingly, a fair percentage of those were females. And we figured that New Zealand males are so damn boring that if this was going to be fun for 45 days, we desperately needed to get the females involved and interested in this. So there was a real push for that. Um, we recognised that all sorts of people around the country just weren't interested in rugby, so we created the concept of wrapping a, a nationwide festival around the tournament. And um, ultimately that delivered about 1,100 events. But what it really did is it gave individual places and, and people everywhere who really weren't interested in going along to the rugby or following it, an opportunity to contribute through involvement in the festival because they wanted their own community to look good, to shine. 
Um, and we also wanted to make sure that the international people uh, understood that this was uh, an event for everybody, not just for New Zealanders. There was a real risk. When we'd won the hosting rights, it was a pretty commonly held uh, thought in England um, that New Zealand is, is just too small, too isolated, too obsessed with the All Blacks, and our people are too boring to run a really good Rugby World Cup. Um, I kept that thought in front of all of us for four years, just as a little bit of motivation. But what it was telling me is that um, if we were going to run what was to be a successful event, um, it had to be an event that, that really opened up and welcomed everybody and made them feel a genuine part of it. It couldn't just be about the All Blacks. It had to be about all of the 20 teams. It had to be about all of the people that were prepared to come to New Zealand to support them. It had to be about all of the people who weren't interested in rugby, uh, but who were proud to be New Zealanders and actually wanted to be part and in the middle of something special for our country and actually make a contribution to it. And by broadening that theme of effectively a stadium of four million rugby nuts into a stadium of four million hosts, what we did is we actually opened up the opportunity for every Kiwi to see where they could make a contribution to the success of something that ultimately was going to be really important to New Zealand. Um, so we started approaching not just the rugby people, who we did, did want to, to love this event, but we started approaching the female population and say, hey, we know you're not really going to love the rugby on the field, but just think what sort of experience you're going to have around this. Think of the vibrancy and the fun around town, and then even in the stadium itself. And we did take a lot of care to make sure that, that uh, in the stadium it was, a, it was an incredibly different and a, and a really fun atmosphere for all of the matches. Because after all, there were 48 matches in Rugby World Cup, and the All Blacks at best were only going to play in seven of them. So we had 41 other matches that we had to make sure that New Zealanders would respond to and actually be part of creating the atmosphere that would, would make them into something great. Um, we went out to the little communities. There was a real risk, uh, given the financial constraints we were under, that we could make a decision to keep this tournament only in the big places. But we actually went exactly in the opposite direction. We said, this, this tournament's going around New Zealand. So we made sure that, that a whole lot of places were able to host matches that might have otherwise missed out. So in the end, Palmerston North, Wangarei, Nelson, um, Invercargill, they were given matches to host, and, and boy, did they have to the flavour of the tournament. And then the team said to us they wouldn't mind seeing a bit of New Zealand when they, they were here. So we would send them right around New Zealand. So places like Ashburton and Blenheim and, and Whanganui and Gisborne and Kirikiri, they had to look after a team for a week or so. They adopted them, they looked after them, they provided them with something really special. Those teams really responded to that. The international media that were out here really responded to it. Um, everybody lifted their game, and it just was a snowball effect. From the time those, those Tongans arrived at the airport, right through the whole tournament, uh, there was just this day after day, New Zealanders standing up looking after our guests, making sure they had a fantastic time, um, enjoying what was happening on the field and generally uh, showing off. And we did just an absolutely magnificent job. You know, um, all right, we had the leverage of a, a special event, but uh, the reality is a lot of the principles that I've just talked about um, can apply in lots of different situations. And I'm thinking of you. Um, I'm thinking about the fact that you have a great story and that a whole lot of other people in the country need to know about that story because if they can receive that story in the right way, they're going to believe it. You know, I was talking to the minister before and, boy, he's passionate. And in the space of about three or four minutes, he'd given me a, a thumbnail sketch of the potential of your industry. Um, you're already a significant part of our economy and who we are. But if you get a few things right, that's going to grow and grow and grow, and it's going to remain a, a really important part. And if you get absolutely lucky, then of course it can, can absolutely snowball um, to something incredibly special. Um, but others need to know that. You've got great things you can tell them about. Um, and I just think back to the Rugby World Cup and the way we sold our story. There's a real tendency for people when they're telling a story to want to tell it in their own words. 
and then they can't understand sometimes why others don't get it. I mean, it, just a simple analogy. You know, when you go overseas and you're in a country where English is not the language and you want something or you're trying to converse with the locals, so you, you talk to them and they look at you with a, a blank stare and you get really frustrated. So you talk louder because it's a hell of a lot easier to understand what you're saying if you're yelling at someone rather than just talking quietly. Well, you know, the, the reality is a story um, is best told in the language of the person who's receiving the story, not the person uh, who's telling the story. And we spent an enormous amount of time in Rugby World Cup customising our story, I suppose, and putting it into the language of the people that we were talking to so that, it, that actually it was a lot easier for them to accept that and understand it, uh, receive it, uh, start to buy into it, and then ultimately come to believe in it and start to become our ambassadors, in your case, your ambassadors, telling that story to other people. Um, so just think about that. Just think about uh, the fact at the heart of your industry you have an authentic, true, great story to tell and it could become even better and better as the years go by. Um, tell that story in the right way and everybody is going to be looking at you and uh, being thrilled that you're part of New Zealand. Um, I know there's, there's occasionally been tension between tourism and, and your industry. Um, you know, both of those industries can, can live together easily. Both of them can work together to contribute a huge amount uh, to the growth and, the, and the, the strength of New Zealand as a country. And that, that is something that we all have to commit to. We cannot put fences up around us. We cannot put, keep ourselves inside of silos. Uh, you know, we're a small country. We've all got to be part of this together. And uh, so I'm saying to you, as, as someone that has a voice in tourism, that's the way I'd love to interact with, with your industry. And I, from the discussions I've had with the likes of David Robinson tonight, I feel that's, I'm sure that's the way you guys would also want to want to communicate with tourism and with others. What I also uh, want to tell you, though, is that when you're telling your story, um, the greatest thing is, is when you actually can see people telling it to others on your behalf. But they don't actually have to completely and utterly believe it. And so... You know, when we were telling people and they were getting into it and starting to tell other people about the fact this was tw about 20 teams, not one, we knew damn well that that one team still mattered a hell of a lot. And when it came down to the, to the, to the crunch um, towards the end of the tournament, um, the, the great thing is our country had done such a great hosting job that everyone else was giving us licence to start concentrating back on our team a little bit. And because of what I said before with the Aussies ending up on our side of the draw, that crunch time came one week earlier than I think we expected it in the semi-final at Eden Park. And this tournament went from being a happy-go-lucky event right around New Zealand into something that was incredibly nerve-wracking for those three or four days leading into the, to the Australian semi-final. You know, the All Blacks did fantastically in the first ten minutes of that match and put us out of our misery, really, and they, they went on and did, a, did well to win that match. Uh, and we knew then we'd won the Rugby World Cup because all we had to do was play the French in the final. And, and they'd been absolutely useless until then. And so the week leading into the final against the French was absolutely and utterly completely different to the week leading into the semi-final against the Aussies. You know, all we were doing was counting down the hours till the match was over and Richie could lift up the cup and we'd just get on with celebrating. Um, didn't quite work out that way, did it? We got a bit of a, a hint, I think, um, when the haka was done. Um, you know, the All Blacks, obviously, it was a special haka for the Rugby World Cup final. It was pretty intense. Well, the French team, instead of standing quietly and accepting this on their 10-metre mark, they linked arms, they formed themselves into an arrow, and they started advancing on, on the All Black team. Well, you can't do that. It's against the rules. Well, they did it, and I thought, oh, OK, they'll stop it halfway. Well, they didn't. They carried it right up into the faces of the All Blacks, and I think we... We got a sense then that if we'd underestimated these guys during the week, um, we were in for a real match in the final, and so it proved. I mean, it was uh, an incredibly tense time. Um, all sorts of things that we didn't expect. Who expected that Dan Carter wouldn't be playing for the All Blacks in the most important game 
um, well, he wasn't there, and, and uh, Aaron Cruden wasn't there in the end either. Uh, instead, it was Stephen Donald. Um, you know, I know some of your international people will, won't have a clue what I'm talking about, but most New Zealanders, um, uh, before the Rugby World Cup finals, Stephen Donald was not synonymous with a fantastic all-black team. Um, there's a seismometer underneath Eden Park, and it measured uh, crowd noise during the final, and the New Zealand Herald ran uh, the printout of it afterwards. The second biggest shake noise that happened during the Rugby World Cup final was when Stephen Donald ran onto the field as a replacement. Um, seismometers cannot measure whether it's happiness or anxiety that they are. <laughs> but anyway, it was a fairy tale story for him, and that was a fantastic thing uh, for him. But, you know. 24 minutes, you said 10 minutes to go, that was nerve-wracking, it wasn't, it was 24 minutes to go that Thierry Dusitoire scored underneath the post for France and the score was 8-7. 24 minutes where the whole country went into a fetal position. Um, <laughs> where we catastrophised, we completely lost our faith in the All Blacks, we gave up on them, they gave up on themselves um, until three minutes to go and there was an injury break. And during that injury break, you could feel it inside Eden Park. It went from being deathly quiet to a sudden realisation that all we had to do for the first time in our history was try and win a match by one point, and that actually meant we'd win the match and win the Rugby World Cup. You know, normally we try and blitz everyone, and sometimes we cause us our own disasters by doing that. Uh, three minutes out, the crowd realised it. They went from being deathly quiet to the crescendo of noise that, that I think the noise, the psychic energy that went into the All Blacks at that stage just lifted them entirely. You know, they got hold of the ball, they held on to it for three minutes. They were still deep in their own territory and for three minutes they just moved up the field uh, metre by metre. Graham Henry had sent a, a message on the field to the players to kick the hell out of it and get it down the French. French end, Richie McCaw had said, no, nope, let's just hold this ball and not give it back to them. And for three minutes, that's what they did. And in the end, the whistle went and we'd won. Um, and we were psychologically damaged. Um, <laughs> but in the end, we were happy. Uh, I, hey, I think the message out of that one is, is they... It took them 24 years to do that, but they persevered and they persevered and they persevered. They had some dreadful moments and they bounced back from it and eventually they got there. We as a country uh, had one shot at it. You know, everyone was telling us we were never going to host a Rugby World Cup again. The professional age has, has cut that out of our reach. Um, so our country really had to perform on the, on the stage. And we, together, all of us did. Um, your industry has that power, that potential. Um, it will be hard slog, uh, it won't go smoothly. Um, but there will be others that will join in with you if they can get a sense and a sniff of what you're about, if they start to hear your stories of success and they start to see, see you and hear you talking about dealing with the difficult issues that always are gonna be in the middle of this. Um, get it right and before you know it, you'll be doing exactly what Richie's doing, and you will have deserved it. Thanks, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed your conference, and uh, good luck tomorrow morning for the rest of it. See you.